Hello and welcome everybody, I'm Proper Varian and today is a great day. I had a great lunch, the sun is shining, the temperatures are really nice and today I'm here to ruin your day because I want to do a ranking that is objectively correct of all of the important CK2 DLC. Obviously I don't mean the portrait or the music or the unit DLCs because I mean, what do you want me to tell you, right? Uh, those were sold separately if you didn't play CK2, now you know that is obviously no longer the case but it was just a different time is, I w is what I would like to tell myself to sleep well. Either way, today we're going to go over this, I will give you all of my Opinion. I will also always show you what is going on in these DLCs, what you got with them when you buy them. You get a general overview there and then I will tell you what I think about them both today but also in retrospective because obviously oftentimes you'll see age differently compared to how they were received initially. So let's just start with Sword of Islam, the very first DLC here for CK2. I gotta tell you Sword of Islam, um, I'm actually not that big a fan. I'm not that big a fan because I think that yes it was really cool and you have to take that into account in CK2 because it came from CK1 and there wasn't too much time Time. I, I once heard that they originally planned to make Muslims playable in 1.0 of CK2, uh, CK2 but then decided not to do that just because there wasn't any time. Um, this was a big step. This made the Muslims playable. It made it so that you could expect that many other people would also become playable as you go. It was this very first step into making CK2 something uniquely different from CK1 but it also doomed Muslims for the rest of CK2. What I mean here is that, yes, you have unique mechanics, yes, you have flavor, and it is all cool, but there was definitely this sort of slant to it where it's just like, man, this stuff is really superficial. Then you got Open Inheritance, which is the Ottoman inher Inheritance System, which is at the end of the timeline, and even then, yeah, it's just kind of weird, and this stuck with the Muslims until the very end of CK2. Um, you had the decadent system which is this amazing idea because it makes it so that realms will rise and fall and rise and fall but for the player it very very quickly and very easily becomes trivial and just the task of keeping the number down. While it does make the map look a bit more interesting, overall it is a detractor. So I'm gonna tell you this is a DLC that you can't really dismiss because it was just so vital in getting the ball rolling for making Crusader Kings what it is today. But it's just a C for me. Um, I, I can't put it any higher up in good conscience. Now the next one is Legacy of Rome and I will have a bit of a more negative opinion here I think than many other people because Legacy of Rome was huge as well. In CK1 and in CK2 1.0 you had this situation where if vessels were, they didn't like you, right? They would just revolt. They just had a percentage that said, I will rebel. I am angry, this is my chance to rebel. And they would do it separately, it was the funniest thing. This brought in factions, it brought in everything related to, for example, uh, the actual mobilization, right, with the liege levies, this huge, huge change, uh, it gave you, and this is a, something that I'm a huge fan of, the improve your ruler system where you can set yourself ambitions and many, many other content delivery systems in CK2 worked into that, really great stuff. But the actual stuff for Rome, for the Byzantine Empire, for the Orthodox Church, Man, that's, that stuff was, was not perfect. Not to mention that also everything related to retinues was basically just like... I don't know, it's, it's a cool system, much much better than the pure levy system that we had before, but it was just so heavy on producing exploits. I think Middle Arms definitely is the better evolution there, which makes sense, it came afterwards, right? And so I gotta tell you, Legacy of Rome, I'm not a Roma boo. I did not do 15 runs just unifying Rome. I did one SPQR. I, I got, right, we, we did this on the channel. We did every single achievement for CK2. And I did SPQR and I never wanted to touch Rome again. I hated that. It, it was absolutely atrocious. So all in all, the, up, uh, the upgrades that this brought really sort of catapulted CK2 past CK1. But at the uh, same time, similar to sort of Islam, I would argue, you had a fairly superficial amount of both flavor and at the same time mechanics related to Rome and orthodoxy. So for me, this is also indeed just a C. Then over here we have, of course, Sunset Invasion. Oh, Sunset Invasion. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. So there is something I think that people that then picked up the game later on, which of course is the majority of CK2 players because people didn't really know CK2 until it popped off with the old guards and the Republic. But people don't know that when Sunset Invasion came out, everybody was convinced that this is going to be one of the very few DLC made for CK2 because that was the sort of plan that was communicated to us. And it came out and people were like, this is it. Like, you could have done whatever and you chose Sunset Invasion with this slot of DLC. People were not heavy, uh, happy and this reputation stuck with Sunset Invasion. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you, CK2 has, especially in the late phase of its existence, done a lot of supernatural, a lot of ahistoric, a lot of crazy stuff and a lot of that made the game significantly better. I think Aztec Invasion is actually a part of this and I think Aztec Invasion 
still carries the burden of coming out and being received in the light of, oh my god, this is one of the little content that we will get post-release. I think the Aztec invasions were always fun. I also know that, <laughs> that not a lot of people will appreciate this take, because whenever I had this on in playthroughs on the channel, people would legitimately get angry. Like, oh my god, you just ruined this playthrough. I always liked it because it just mixed up Western Europe. You know, you see this in Eastern Europe or uh, even in Asia, of course, you have the Seljuks, you have the Timurids, you have everybody sort of making their way through Persia into Asia Minor and so on. You have the Crusade mixing up this area and in the North then, you have the Vikings until they stop existing. Just in the West, absolutely nothing. The Aztecs are a good game changer there, so that is a B for me. Then the next one is the Republic. And the Republic, I'm... I have a bit of a love-hate relationship, which I think is the biggest description that you can give on my takes of DLCs for CK2. The Republic has some of the most impressive frameworks, in my opinion, when it comes to everything related to trade. It's so ambitious, the way the calculation works, where if you secure a route, basically, of sea zones that you dominate, you will get bonuses. Everybody else will benefit on top of that as well. Of course, as you have trade posts, it enhances the wealth of their county. Such an intricate system. And what did it boil down to? Yeah, that's right. It literally just boiled down to you going, whatever I do, it will make me infinite money. I loathe Mac a Merchant Republics in CK2 in the final version because you always have to found one. It will always be worth it and it will always print you money. But the actual really, really great underlying math goes completely under. Uh, it's also, of course, one of the many symptoms that CK2 DLCs later on would have where everything that they introduce largely just acts as a resource dump. Uh, when we, for example, take a look at the College of, of Cardinals, and I think I'm going to get a huge blowback for this as well, but uh, when we take a look at this, that's a huge money dump. In, in no other way is that just a money dump, because we just had so much money, which is why later on, of course, we got all these great wonders and all that stuff, because that was a very, very valid money dump. The Republic, for me, is definitely, definitely better. Goes into A, but I'm going to be honest with you again, uh, so deeply flawed, I, it, it depresses me every time I think about it. The next one is the legendary Old Guards. I think Old Guards is when most people got into CK2. Uh, I also got to tell you, before the Old Guards, I actually was largely playing Darkest Hour at that point in time. Um, I did pick up the CK2 DLCs, I, I played them every now and again, but Old Guards was the entry point for me. And the Old Guards, all around in my opinion, is just a really great DLC, which is surprising because this is 2013. We're talking about a completely different structure, way fewer people, of course, smaller project sizes, smaller calculation. Uh, the Old Guard comes out, new bookmark, differently playing faiths. And I think, yes, definitely also in a heavily, heavily stylized version, similar to how Islam is depicted in sort of Islam, but in a version that has so much meat to it. There's just so much going on there. You have these prepared invasions. You got the pillaging in general. You have all of these new aspects that previously weren't there and previously didn't mix anything up. All of a sudden, even in 1066, if you don't play in 867, you can play the uh, pagans there and you will have a great experience. Really, really cool stuff. Um, the old guards, surprisingly, because especially early on, the early DLC just have a very different character from what they would later on become. But the Old Guards, for me personally, definitely an S tier DLC. There's no way around it. There was everything in it. And even today, I look at Northern Lords and I think Northern Lords is actually a really great DLC. Also cheaper, by the way. Or was the Old Guards? Was that 999? Let me actually take a look at this, right? Um, I, I looked at this and I, I, my eyes almost fell out when I saw that all of the CK2 expansions were 1499. Northern Lords is cheaper than the Old Guards. Something, I don't know, something feels very weird about this. But anyway, Northern Lords, for example, the one thing where I'm like, Northern Lords didn't do this and it sucks so bad. I don't think Prepared Invasions should come back. I think those were cool to look at, but then became very cheesy and very weird to deal with because they would just spawn in infinite troops. But what Northern Lords is missing is an actual missionary conversion mechanic. It's so depressing to see, you know, in an 867 start, all of Scandinavia, all of Russia still being pagan. I mean, come on, right? At some point. The Old Guards nailed it. It is definitely, with good reason, for good reason, I should say, the DLC that attracted so, so many people to CK2 back in the day. Now, the next one is Sons of Abraham. Sons of Abraham, I actually think, is a really good DLC, except for its main feature, <laughs> which is the College of Cardinals. I think Sons of Abraham uh, oftentimes gets sort of underestimated, right? Because you're looking at something where it's like, oh yeah, okay, sure, it makes uh, Jewish people playable, it makes it so that you get some holy orders, it makes it so that you have this fairly inconsequential Mutazil and Ashari traits, you know, these sort of situations right there. Uh, I'm gonna be honest with you, what it added in flavor was a huge addition to the game. 
what did it enable you to do compared to what you couldn't do before that in how you manage, for example, your inheritance with, you know, all of a sudden you can do pilgrimages, you can send people to monasteries and so on. That stuff is huge. I think that this was, I think, almost entirely. Am I wrong here? You got the monastery stuff, you got the pilgrimages, obviously. You got uh, religious events and so on. You can play Jews. Um, you can ask the Pope for, for money. I think this made it into CK3 wholesale, except... The College of Cardinals, because the College of Cardinals really sucks. Um, <laughs> I love the motto behind the College of Cardinals mod for CK3. I talk to him all the time. Zach, shout out to you. Great fella. But I hate that system. Because A, that's not how that worked, historically speaking. But more importantly, that stuff was just designed. Because at some point, they were like, what the hell do we do with all the money resource that the player has? And the answer was, dump it in the Cardinals. That stuff sucks really bad. Um, I'm going to tell you, though. That doesn't take away from the fact just how much Sons of Abraham added beyond that. I'm going to put it into A. For me, this is a very, very clear A DLC. The Rajas of India um, was the massive, massive map, exp map expansion in 2014, which is incredible to think about. This was uh, just about two years, a little bit more than two years after CK2 came out. Obviously, the first two years were basically just full of making people playable and adding some flavor. Rajas of India went further, said, we're going to add India. And... I actually am a big fan of this. I think there's a lot to be gained by the map being further in the east. I'm saying this largely, for example, if you only play, let's say, in Europe, right, you will see the impact of the hordes, uh, the hordes, I mean the Seljuks, for example, and the Timurids and whatnot, actually forming, right, and then creating an empire in these regions. You will see the impact, and with that alone, there's a massive, massive benefit to gain there. I think the map expansion was a smart choice. I have a bone to pick with this DLC, Mostly because of the way that I remember it when it was actually released. This was the worst launch, I think, outside of Hearts of Iron 3, literally not working. And Vicky 2 DLC less. But let's put that aside. At least Vicky 2 worked and Hearts of Iron 3 was very... Yeah, okay, that was, that was not very good at all. But Rajas of India was so awful, both for performance, for balancing, for everything else. I believe there was a bug, actually, where India would just have constant permanent revolts. It was really bad, and I hated it. Other than that, interesting ideas here for sure. I just don't think that I can get over these feelings where I didn't... I, I The launch was just so bad, I'm sorry. Rajas of India cannot recover for me, but it's not because of the map expansion per se, it's because of the way it worked. Now, the other DLC <laughs> that released immediately after in 2014, um, I, I hated this one. I, I hate this one still. I think it adds a lot of really good stuff. Charlemagne is one of the DLCs that... I find interesting as an experiment, I think the time period, the implementation, and the way it works with CK's mechanics really sucks. I personally am a declared enemy of 769. I never want to see that again. I want to see again 936, maybe 1081. You know, I want to see those start dates again. I do not want to see 769. Never do this again, please. I beg you. Um, what it did add was that you can found new kingdoms now, and it also overhauled the regency, but I never was too fond of that. For me, Charlemagne, yes, sure, it added so that you can form kingdoms, which is now a staple feature without a doubt. But Charlemagne for me is also a D. That I, I, Charlemagne was probably the least used start date for me and the actual mechanics. I mean, tributaries, yes, it's really cool, but tributaries also was like, you do it and then they go like, okay, I'm a tributary now and that's it. At some point it might break or it might not break, but that is all the interaction you get. So this is a really cool approach. There was a lot of experiments in there. I just am not too fond of any of it. Now, the next one, Way of Life. What a goated DLC. I mean, my God, going into focuses, making it so that you get much, much more to do in peacetime. The duels, the seducing, the uh, break, uh, breakup with your lover. That stuff was so, so good. This DLC, Way of Life, is absolutely goaded when it comes to any content that makes it so that you have more things to do, that you can build your character more. Which obviously, whether you think it's better or worse, I definitely think it's better, but which obviously influenced CK3's way of approaching this with the lifestyle trees, the perks, uh, and, and everything that you get from there when it comes to the actual interactions. I do find it very funny that, um... <laughs> you couldn't break up with your lovers? Before? I honestly, I did not realize this. But for me, way of life, the way I remember it, is definitely an absolute must-have, an absolutely must-play DLC. Now, horse loads, um... I've played a whole lot of Horse Lords. Um, I, I've played a lot on the channel, I've played a lot in private. It's a lot of fun, until it isn't. Horse Lords is, is the most, I think, janky DLC that they've ever made for any of these games. At least I think so. I'm pretty sure 
It's officially, basically, one of the biggest jank fests that has ever been released. Horse Lords is a really cool idea. Obviously, added a lot of stuff in general. Um, I think what I really appreciate for it is all the mercenary stuff, all the raiding adventures, all that stuff is really cool. The actual nomads, nomadic gameplay and all that approach, it falls apart so quickly. It's just not good. If they did this in CK3 like this, this is always my personal comparison. If they did this, would I shred it? Would I, would I rip this to pieces? Would I be mean? And I would be like, what the hell is going on in here? Because Horse Lords, as a mechanic, does not function. It can be fun to interact with, both if you are them or if you are against them, but it's not good. Um, Horse Lords for me goes right here. It's, it's, not, it's not a D because of what it added, but man, that was a mess. Um, then the next one, the one of the best DLCs actually, I mean, yeah, it definitely goes on the top. I don't even need to spoil this here. Conclave was incredibly strong. It was insanely good. I still, to this day though, have friends that got Conclave and hated CK3 from there on out. They legitimately just went, this is the worst thing anybody's done to me in my life because it made the game harder. You, need to, you needed to interact with your vassals. I do not want to go back. CK3 definitely cut down there, and I think in a negative way. I think there were more lessons to learn from Conclave than actually implemented. Um, we do have vassal contracts now, but I also think those sort of fell flat, which definitely went into the same direction of, like, you need to regulate your vassals on a personal level. You have to have a lot more power over your council. You need to influence them. I think CK3 definitely falls short there. Conclave is an absolutely amazing DLC. Um, I, I think the whole concept around it, the way the system was implemented, just really, really good. The Reapers do. Um, I think... I feel very similar, actually. You know, the best comparison that I have here. I feel very similar about the Reapers do as I feel about the Merchant Republics. I think the background of Reapers do what it meant to do to make these diseases more dynamic, to spread it all out, to give you more interactions with it, to mourn, for example, when one of your loved ones goes away. The Black Death. That... The Black Death is just, when it pops up on the map, it's worse than the Mongols. You look at that and you go, oh, Jesus Christ, this is going to be awful. The thing where the Reapers do isn't perfect, in my point of view anyway, is when it goes and actually sort of goes into this direction, okay, and now to interact with this DLC, please invest in a hospital which directly makes you just ignore what the DLC adds. I think when you have a DLC where that is the gameplay loop, which ultimately the hospital was, you would build it up over your play uh, over your gameplay or your playthrough so that you can then get spared by the Black Death, that sort of thing. When that is what happens, I just feel like it's not perfect, right? There's, there's something that is missing there. Reapers do, nonetheless, it's an A. It's a really good me mechanic, it's just that ultimately the way it worked out didn't sit right with me. Now, the next one, um, and I actually got a... Can, can, I, can I do that here? Can I... <laughs> can I no, actually, wait a minute. Add a, add a row, below, uh, row below, yep, there you go. Um, I'm going to rename this to... Hated. This is just the hated column, okay? Monks and Mystics is the least favorite DLC. No, they, they are EO4 DLC that I dislike more. It's the least favorite DLC, in my opinion, for CK2. Monks and Mystics, I don't fault them at all for what they introduced here when it comes to the idea of societies, of people associating for reasons other than the feudal hierarchy. I think that is a great addition. I think there's a lot going on there that is to be considered, but societies were really, really garbage. <laughs> As I said, I'm going to start a war today, okay? Societies and their flaws, in my opinion, basically came from the direction where there's two major issues with them. A, they are global. Societies on a global level make it so that you do not care for anybody in these societies because you will not interact with them except on the societal level. I remember when the, assassin, uh, when the assassins introduced me to their order and were like, Hello, King of France. I am here living in India. How's it going? You are now introduced. It's like, what the hell is going on? I will never talk to you again. We have no relationship. This is complete nonsense. And this was true for virtually every society. Obviously, you had more limited societies, like the monastic order, for example, was at the very least limited by religion, but fundamentally, they were global. Societies going forward, I definitely want to see more regional, more dynamic alignments, and that would be really cool in CK2. It sucked. But even worse, societies in CK2 fundamentally were a system where you joined, and then you would just accrue points, and eventually you would be like, oh yeah, I'll spend it on this, I'll spend it on that. There were no trade-offs, there was no, like, dynamic to learning things. You would always have the same path, because you would just accrue points, and then put them in, they'd be like, yep, this is it, I'm the leader now, all right, here's what we do. Every single time. They are the mechanified, the, the personified version of very, very strict event chains. Once you've seen them, you've seen them. 
Um, I think a lot of different mods have done a lot with societies, but it doesn't change just how much I hate this content. I think it is absolutely grating. And even worse, uh, the devil worshippers in particular, I hate that content so much. Every time I see it, I cringe. I, I always just clicked it away. I never tried to join them. And when I did, I regretted it immediately. As soon as, oh, I walk past this garden. Let's skin all the people. As soon as, I just, okay, you know, just put them away. Jade Dragon, um, I think, is a good DLC. I don't really am very fond of the interactions that you can have with China, largely because they were so uh, restricted. They, they followed the society model, ultimately. But Jade Dragon added rally points for your troops. Don't even ask, okay? It added rally points for your troops. It gave you new castles, Belli, um, and it gave you these interactions with China. It also gave you the Western Protectorate, which was cool um, almost all the time, basically. So in general, I think this was not a bad DLC. I'm not too fond of it, but I, I think it's quite okay. Yeah, I definitely would put it honestly above Legacy of Rome and sort of Islam just because of the CBs. It changed the dynamic overall quite a bit. And then uh, let's just honestly, let's just not look at the ruler designer. Who cares? Don't pay $4.99, okay? All right, and last but without a doubt, not least, is Holy Fury. Holy Fury is the biggest of the big, the, the creme de la creme. It was the, really, the amazing finishing point to CK2. Uh, it came with so many new things, the succession laws that reworked, a bunch of pagan stuff, but also looked more yet again into everything going on, of course, with Sainthood, uh, the coronations, the warrior lodges were so cool. That is the only type of society where I'm like, that was actually really good. It added Holy Furry, if you recall that. It did Shattered and Randomized Worlds, which I didn't use too much, but hey, it's a nice, really, functionality right there. Um, in general, it added the Crusades that we're now used to in CK3 as much as they can be cumbersome, they're very cumbersome, but the principle of planning these wars in that fashion was added uh, at that point. Holy Fury was an amazing DLC, an amazing send-off. Obviously, we had an Iron Sentry right afterwards, I, I believe it was afterwards anyway. Holy Fury is the one and only DLC that CK2 did, in my opinion, that really follows this new model of DLCs where you look at the content and you go, wow, that is a very systemic sort of rework. You look at all these things and it adds everywhere. It's just a massive, massive uh, you know, DLC. If I could, I would definitely put this on the uh, upper tier, even higher than S, but it definitely, I mean, Way of Life and Conclave were basically what Holy Fury was for 2018. But before that, it's just super high quality, really, really good. And ultimately, I really just want to end the video by saying I hated Monks and Mystics more than anything else. My apologies if you worked on it. I think it's, I hate it so much. Uh, for the moment, let me know what you think about this ranking. I think it is basically perfect. And I will see you later, alligator.